Good evening, everybody. This is Dr. Wooler checking in for another webinar here, installment through Great Plains Lab. I appreciate you joining me tonight for this uh, webinar. I think you're going to find this information very interesting, particularly if you have been doing organic acid tests, either as a practitioner or perhaps you've done testing on yourself or family members or if you have a child on the spectrum. I think you'll find this interesting as well. Uh, a couple things, housekeeping things, with respect to the GoToWebinar system. If we're using the latest technology, we all, you know, we have updated computers and I have a new headset and the highest internet speed possible. <clears throat> but sometimes the internet can be a bit glitchy depending on region, regional storms and other things that may be happening. So periodically you may hear some hissing sounds the audio can sometimes cut out for 15 to 20 seconds we've experienced that my recommendation is just hold on and, and things will usually come back a couple things you could do on your end with your computer if you have your email open if you have other web browsers that are open you know things that you're looking at while listening to it you can always shut those things down because those things will also slow your computer down and that sometimes can interfere with your audio on your end. So on my computer, I've shut everything down as possible uh, just to increase the speed, but you can do that on your end too, okay? <clears throat> All right, so let's go ahead and get started here. So we're gonna talk about, specifically we're gonna talk about the neurotransmitter section of the or organic acid test and relate you know some things interesting things clinically that can be seen with that and so when we're talking about the neurotransmitter section of the organic we're talking about primarily homovanillic acid which is linked to dopamine vanille mandelic acid which is linked to norepinephrine and the ratio between the two and then the tryptophan metabolites specifically 5-hydroxy indolacetic acid as well as quinolinic acid and we'll we'll take a look at some of these ratios in the organic acids test itself most commonly in about 90 percent of the time honestly the number 36 that you see here on your screen 5-H-I-A-A is going to be low to low normal and I've seen that quite a bit with kids on the spectrum and that indicates that there's a bit of a sluggishness in the serotonin system in about maybe I, it's hard to give a but about five percent of the time maybe ten percent of the time the quinolinic acid marker will be high and we're going to talk a lot about quinolinic acid tonight more commonly what you will see is number 39 quinolinic acid to 5 HIA ratio in about 60 percent maybe even higher 70 75 percent but around there that value is high sometimes just kind of high normal or slightly high and it's, but the quinolinic acid is, is either normal or low normal. So it's generally linked more towards a serotonin uh, deficiency per se than truly an elevated quinolinic acid. But there's a number of different scenarios that will come up. So the first thing we're going to talk about is the HVA, the homovanillic acid, and then we're going to transition from there into the 5-hydroxy indolacetic acid give you some indicators of what that indicates or what that deals with and then we'll finally wrap up with quinolinic acid so that's going to be the three primary areas that we're going to focus on tonight if you post questions um, there's not time for me to go through questions after these webinars so those questions will be held by Great Plains and they email them to me later <clears throat> if you want to uh, Ask questions of me if you're a practitioner or, or a parent with a child on the spectrum. You can always post me through my website at autismactionplan.com, and I'm always available on a daily basis there as well. Um, some of you may know that I'm in the middle of doing uh, an actually an, a three-month online course for health practitioners as well as parents on autism, and I'm going to share some information with you at the end about that because even though that course is going on now there is the potential if people are interested of still getting in but first things first so when you're looking at these neurochemicals they're looking at these neurotransmitters 
the question always comes up is do they specifically represent brain neurotransmitters? And the short of it is, is no. They're not strictly looking at neurotransmitters coming from the brain. So no neurotransmitter test on the market can absolutely indicate that the neurotransmitters that are being picked up in the urine are 100% reflective of what is coming from the brain or that what's called the central nervous system. The metabolites, HVA and VMA linked to dopamine and norepinephrine, epinephrine respectively. Are metabolites of these neurochemicals coming from the central nervous system, the peripheral nervous system, as well as the adrenal glands? A lot of people don't realize that the adrenal glands are actually modified nervous tissue. The 5-HAA, which is derived from serotonin, is, can come from the central nervous system, but about 90% of it of what is generated in the body actually comes from the gastrointestinal tract. And then we also have platelets that produce serotonin as well. The greatest percentage of these neurochemicals that are being measured off the organic acid test are not from the central nervous system. But certainly a percentage are. The important point I want to get across is that the metabolic enzymes that are involved in the conversion of these neurotransmitters, they are uniform throughout the body, uniform throughout the peripheral nervous system and the central nervous system. So when you're seeing imbalances in these neurochemicals, whether it was, say, it was brought on by Clostridia bacteria, for example, what you're seeing on the test is representative of what is happening throughout the entire body, including the brain, because the, the metabolic conversion enzymes function the same, whether it's in the peripheral nervous system or the central nervous system. What's important about that is you have to then apply the test clinically to the individual. The number itself is important, but how does that number relate to the specific presentation of the individual is just as important. Because I have seen situations where there have been kids I've worked with who had, let's say, a clostridia marker that was 400 of the HPHPA, but they didn't have the typical aggressive behavior, self-injurious behavior, irritability, agitation types of things that generally are represented when clostridia is high. And I've also had situations where I've seen clostridia levels a lot lower in a particular child who did manifest with those problems. So the numbers are important, yeah, but also applying it clinically in every situation is also important. So HVA is a, bri a byproduct of dopamine. VMA is a byproduct of norepinephrine and epinephrine. And then the ratio between the two are important because that can indicate that there may be an excess production or even a deficiency of either dopamine or norepinephrine, depending on which way the, the values are falling. <clears throat> Getting in some, uh, some understanding of how these things are converted is helpful. Now, some of the biochemistry is difficult to remember, and I, I understand that. So that's why a lot of times in all of my presentations, keep showing these things over and over, and many times just showing it in different ways. Tyrosine is amino acid that is converted into something called DOPA or L-dihydroxyphenylalanine. And we need an adequate amount of B6 in order to convert DOPA to dopamine. <clears throat> well, dopamine through the activity of a specific enzyme you see here called dopamine beta hydroxylase will take dopamine and convert it into norepinephrine. Now, the effect of norepinephrine is it has this sympathetic you know, effect throughout the nervous system and increases attention and focusing. And then the byproduct of that is VMA. It turns out that epinephrine, which is mainly produced in the adrenal glands, will also spill over into VMA as well. If you have a situation where VMA is high, it might indicate a situation of excess adrenal stress. And so many times you can look at doing salivary adrenal testing to see if that is in play, but that doesn't always correlate, but it's just something to keep in mind clinically. 
And then, of course, dopamine, its byproduct <clears throat> is into the homovanillic acid. So essentially what's being measured on the oat is the HVA and the VMA, two byproducts of dopamine and norepinephrine, respectively. <clears throat> also what's important is understanding the relationship between these neurochemicals. You can take something like serotonin, for example, and, and understand that it can affect mood and it can improve cognitive function and it can help with fine and gross motor skill development. And that when there's an imbalance in serotonin, there can, or a deficiency of serotonin, that's where we start to run into problems of depression or moodiness. In severe cases of serotonin imbalances, there can be obsessive compulsive behavior or even memory deficits and certainly anxiety. Dopamine is very much involved in the reward and motivation system. It's involved in motor coordination within the brain. It also has an effect on overall cognitive function too, as well as attention. But imbalances can lead to some of the perceptive behavior that you see in autism, some of the uh, self-stimulatory behavior that gets going. Drug addicts, for example, many times will seek out uh, drugs that tend to increase dopamine levels to an extreme level. Severe, severe levels of, of dopamine and susceptible individuals can lead to hallucinations uh, and addictions. That's why it's often uh, a, a problem for addicts. Norepinephrine very much is well linked to attention and focusing, certainly alertness and concentration. And so there's an overlay between these things and the balance between these things, which is just as important as opposed to just trying to stimulate one particular pathway all the time. This is an example of an organic acid test. <clears throat> and the, some of the slides are, are from the previous format of the organic acid test, but the, the, value, the, the markers are still the same. And as you'll notice, this is actually from an autistic uh, individual in my practice. Notice number right here, number 17, HPHPA, which is quite elevated at 319. But also notice these other markers, okay, 2-hydroxyphenylacetic, 4-hydroxyphenylacetic, etc. These are all what are called phenols. And they have a, particularly the 4-hydroxyphenylacetic and the 2-hydroxyphenylacetic, they have a, a chemical similarity to some of these other clostridia bacteria. And so they may also have an adverse effect in the nervous system as far as the negative effect that things like clostridia can cause. But we're going to focus real quickly here on HPHPA. This is a, if you've heard many of my webinars before, you've probably seen this slide a number of times. And it's important just to orient yourself because we talked about dopa and dopamine, okay? And there's our dopamine conversion to homovanillic acid. We talked about norepinephrine and it's spillover into VMA. And then, of course, epinephrine primarily coming from the adrenal glands also can spill over into VMA. If you look at tyrosine, tyrosine is what's needed to produce dopa. Phenylalanine, okay, all will convert itself into tyrosine and also feed that pathway. So if you had a dopamine deficiency, for example, you know, many sometimes using phenylalanine and tyrosine as an amino acid can help fill up that bucket, so to speak, in order to try to promote more dopamine production along with vitamin B6. But from the standpoint of Clostridia bacteria, we've got a problem. If you have Clostridia difficile, Clostridia difficile will take tyrosine and it will convert tyrosine into this compound called 4-cresol. And 4-cresol will inhibit the dopamine beta-hydroxylase enzyme that converts dopamine to norepinephrine, whether it's occurring in the central nervous system or the peripheral nervous system throughout the body. This is not always just brain reactions, even though on the slide it says brain neurotransmitters. Okay, um, Actually, that should be changed. It just should say neurotransmitters. 
Phenylalanine is taken by other types of multiple Clostridia species and it converts it into this compound called HPHPA. It too will inhibit the dopamine beta hydroxylase. On any given oat, in my experience, <clears throat> when the Clostridium markers are high, the one that comes back high more frequently is the HPHPA, probably about 75% of the time compared to the full creosol. But not all of the organic acid tests come back positive for clostridium markers. In the autism population, they come back elevated quite commonly, definitely over 50% in my experience. So if we think about these chemicals now, it turns out that HPHPA inhibits dopamine beta hydroxylase and has been found to track along with a rise in dopamine. And we'll talk about why that's a problem here in a second. Okay, so dopamine goes up, or excuse me, HVA, the byproduct of dopamine goes up, and we're seeing a corresponding increase in HPHPA going up. And then as the dopamine levels drop, or excuse me, as the HPHPA levels drop, you'll see a drop in the dopamine levels too. We don't get much of a shift in the VMA levels, but you sometimes can see a little bit. Well, what about for creosol, this toxin that comes from clostridia? This was an article that I've discussed in many of the presentations I do that talked about P. creosol being a, a byproduct of Clostridia difficile production. And it turns out that Clostridia difficile is only a, one of a few bacteria that's able to ferment this amino acid tyrosine into this P. creosol. Now, I want you just to kind of focus here for a second on this phenolic compound comment. P. creosol is a phenol. We know that many sensitive individuals, certainly a lot of special needs kids, are phenol sensitive. They react very strongly to certain dyes, certain flavorings, certain fruits. But they can also have adverse behavioral reactions, hyperactivity, hyperexcitability, brain stimulation, overstimulation effects by phenols that come from pathogens too. And it turns out that Clostridia is one of them. Now, why do you think Clostridia difficile is producing this toxin? Well, it turns out that it's doing it as its way to, to compete with other types of Clostridia in the intestinal tract or in the environment. And there have been other forms of Clostridia that have developed a resistance to it. So it turns out that the, that the Clostridia is just doing what it does. It's doing its thing. It just turns out that our biochemistry stands in the way or is a it's the collateral damage effect, you know, is that we take the hit. Here's an interesting research article that talks about this. This was this way back in 1983. And, that, and this is an important comment. A wide range of phenols, including P. creosol, are strong inhibitors of dopamine beta hydroxylase, strong inhibitors of this enzyme that take dopamine to norepinephrine. Now also recognize that vitamin C and copper are also necessary to keep this enzyme functioning properly. So if there is a vitamin C deficiency, there is a potential for having a down-regulated or an underperforming dopamine beta hydroxylase. If there is a copper deficiency, that also could be the issue too. The other thing about the clostridia is that the reaction that is attaching to this dopamine beta hydroxylase is irreversible. Okay? Once the p-creosol has incorporated itself into the active site of the enzyme, that enzyme is essentially destroyed. This is why when clostridia levels are high, in my estimation, or I should say in my experience, it needs to be dealt with. Okay? Um, and it needs to be dealt with really as a priority. It doesn't mean that there aren't other things in the organic acid test that are important. But if you've got other nutritional imbalances and you've got yeast and you're trying to deal with those things and you're not dealing with the clostridia, you're not going to get very far. So the clostridia to me is really a priority intervention. And I have other lectures that talk about that and we're talking about that actually to, uh, in 
in, in my uh, autism course and to great extent. So what are the problems of having too much dopamine? Well, there's a lot. And this particular slide walks through a number of different toxic compounds. Okay, And let's just focus on a couple. One is down here, Okay, this dopamine thioether compound that can be produced when dopamine is too high. And you'll notice here it causes what's called apoptosis of brain cells in the presence of excess dopamine. Basically, that means that cells that are in the presence of excess dopamine die fast and die early. So that's not a good thing. Obviously, we, dopamine can create other types of oxidative compounds that are quite stressful and can cause damage in the body, including the depletion of glutathione. The last thing we want to have happen to anybody who's dealing with a chronic health problem, particularly some type of neurological issue, and the autistic kids would certainly fall in that category, of having susceptibility and sensitivity to the lack of glutathione. It also turns out that excess dopamine can incorporate itself into the central nervous system. And what it does is it infiltrates itself into the norepinephrine areas of the sympathetic nervous system. <clears throat> so it can cause an overstimulatory effect in that part of the nervous system that can cause a lot of problems. If you break down what's called the autonomic nervous system, it's broken down into two, you know, two areas, the parasympathetic and the sympathetic. The way to kind of think about this simplistically is the sympathetic is your accelerator, the parasympathetic is the brake, and there needs to be a dynamic balance that's going on in the body all the time. When your sympathetic nervous system is activated, your heart rate goes up. You get an increase in, in, in blood pressure. Um, you get an in, in increase, uh, your pupils dilate. Um, it's just everything becomes more active. You get an increase of adrenaline that's secreted by the adrenal glands. You, you start converting more uh, glycogen, stored glycogen into glucose for energy fuel. Whereas the parasympathetic side of things kind of slows things down. Your heart rate goes down. Your uh, you start stimulating more bile release from the liver. Your, your digestive system becomes more active. It's basically in a state of, of rest and digestion, if you will. And sympathetic is more in a state of activity. And so you're getting shunting of blood away from the digestive system towards the heart and cardio, uh, cardiovascular system in the lungs. And the parasympathetic, you're getting more of a shunting of blood back to the GI system, etc. Well, it turns out that many people who are in chronic stress, and it's not just special needs kids, but they certainly fit this scenario, are in what's called a sympathetic overdrive, a fight or flight response. I've seen many kids on the spectrum come into my office who have chronically dilated pupils, who have very elevated heart rates, who have very poor digestion. Their digestive system is shut down in some respects constipation, etc. Okay, and there can certainly be overactivity in some respects of the parasympathetic nervous system. But in this particular scenario, we get dopamine that can infiltrate itself into that neural circuitry. Well, what are some intervention options that you can think about? Okay, if clostridia is present, it is necessary to treat either with medication or botanicals. And really, honestly, the same is true of candida. Um, but in this particular case, we're talking about clostridia's negative influence on these neurochemicals. Now, I'm not, I don't have time to go through all the different scenarios of clostridia treatment, and I've done past webinars on that that are cataloged on the website. <clears throat> A couple other things, though. If clostridia markers are normal, sometimes you'll still find that the HVA and the VMA are out of balance. So a couple examples. If the, if the HVA is low, low or low normal, for example. Tyrosine is some an option that you could use, 500,000 milligrams a day. And there's another product I like, which we'll talk about here in a sec, called Dopa Plus. Because remember, tyrosine is the amino acid that's the immediate precursor to dopa, which becomes dopamine. I should have put on here too B6. Vitamin B6, you know, can be can be added to the equation as well. If the VMA is low you might be looking at a copper deficiency 
and or a need for additional vitamin C. And one of the things you can do is a copper and zinc profile and Great Plains has that on their panel. It's not real common to have a copper deficiency, particularly in autism, but every once in a while it does show up. Okay, so a couple a couple scenarios there. I like the DOPA Plus because I've used it with kids and I've also used it with adults. It's a combination product of some different herbs. The velvet bean, which is interesting, called Mikuna, actually contains some L-DOPA. So it actually contains the immediate precursor to dopamine. Methylfolate, tyrosine, there's our tyrosine. It's a nice combination blend remedy to essentially try to bolster dopamine levels. Now when would you not want to use this product? You would not want to use this product, nor would you want to use tyrosine, nor would you want to use phenylalanine if there's an active clostridia infection. Because remember, the clostridia, particularly the difficile, is going to grab that tyrosine and make it into 4-creosol. So the dosing ranges are kind of broad, three to six capsules and divided doses used per, between meals. Smaller kids, I, I might even just do one to two capsules and start from there and kind of build up. Another nice product that New Beginnings carries is something called Neural, Neural Plus. It has phenylalanine. In this particular case, it actually has um, some methylfolate and 5-HTP. So instead of having the tyrosine, it has the phenylalanine. And it's got things like quercetin and some other herb, uh, herbs as well. If I was trying to just bolster dopamine levels, I probably would not use this product. I would use more of the Dopa Plus. If I was trying to bolster serotonin levels as well as dopamine levels with the hope that it would also then convert over into improvement in norepinephrine, I would lean more towards the Neuro Plus. <clears throat> and the nice thing about some of the combination remedies is it cuts down on the amount of capsules that you know individuals have to take. All of this is available to, to review online at, at New Beginnings website. So again, let's orient ourselves. Okay, We just talked about Dopa Plus, which contains the tyrosine here. And we talked about Neuro Plus, which contains the phenylalanine. Remember, the Neuro Plus also has 5-HTP in it, whereas the Dopa Plus does not. All right. Well, let's shift gears and talk about tryptophan and serotonin and what that might mean on the organic acid test. Tryptophan is used by the body in a number of different ways. Tryptophan can be used as a fuel source or a protein source, amino acid source for, for our cells, excuse me, our cells as well as my, microbes can use tryptophan. And tryptophan it can be converted into 5-hydroxytryptophan, what is also called 5-HTP. And remember, 90% of the serotonin in the body is actually produced in the GI system. What is being measured off the organic acid test as an indicator of serotonin is this 5-hydroxyindoleacetic acid. The tryptophan can also become something else. It can become quinolinic acid which, if elevated, can be excitotoxic. And I'll talk about and define what excitotoxic means here in a sec. A couple of things with respect to tryptophan and things that can compete for tryptophan. In the presence of what are called <clears throat> large neutral amino acids, these large neutral amino acids, and specifically valine, leucine, and isoleucine, which are called branch chain amino acids, <clears throat> will compete with tryptophan's entry into the brain. What happens is, is the blood-brain barrier will let certain things in and will keep certain things out. So if you have a normal circulating level of tryptophan, and let's say you're taking um, an amino acid supplement or you know, high-protein diet would be more common, over time, there's the potential of causing a tryptophan deficiency because the tryptophan can't get across the blood-brain barrier. <clears throat> so only a small amount of tryptophan actually crosses the blood-brain barrier, 
which could lead to low serotonin production in the central nervous system and depression. Also, uh, clostridium modified amino acids, the tyrosine and the phenylalanine, could do the same thing. <clears throat> so what often is done is that people many times will naturally do this themselves through their diet. Turns out that carbohydrates increase brain tryptophan. And what happens is, is that high carb diets will stimulate insulin. And the insulin will lead to a lowering, particularly of these branch chain amino acids, like leucine, isoleucine, valine. And so when there's less competition on the tryptophan, there's more tryptophan that gets across the blood-brain barrier, and therefore an increase in serotonin production, and people feel good. And this is felt to be why many people who are obese, and I wouldn't say everybody's obese uh, does this, uh, but there's a lot of people who, who, who aren't, aren't obese, but this is why so many people are driven towards a high-carbohydrate diet, is because a lot of times they get a, a flood of tryptophan and serotonin and they feel good from it. High protein diets over time could reduce tryptophan's entry into the brain. Okay, so that's potentially. It's not to sit there and say that if you go out and have a high protein meal that you're going to get depressed. It's what takes place over time, not you know just periodically. So the question will come up is what's better? Okay. Do we use more tryptophan to try to counter this, or do we use 5-HTP? In many respects, biochemically, the use of 5-HTP is preferred because of the inability of 5-HTP to stimulate quinolinic acid. So here we are. Let me see if I get my cursor here. Here we're sitting at 5 hydroxy acetic acid. Remember I told you about 90% of the time it's low to low normal. <clears throat> All right? And we've got an elevated quinolinic acid 5-HAA ratio, okay? which occurs a lot on the organic acid test. So even though our quinolinic acid level is normal, we've got a ratio that's high, which tells us that we're kind of moving in the direction of excess conversion of tryptophan to quinolinic acid. Okay, it's not an all or none phenomenon, but we're moving that direction. And remember, at any given time when you do an organic acid test or whatever test you do, it's a snapshot in time. Okay. Now, <clears throat> this particular study I have in this presentation and others I've done, not because it was a great study, and, and the, uh, actually the reference is old, it's 1976. But if we look at it, they were using... 150 milligrams of 5-HTP to treat depression. Now, they only treated it for seven days. It's kind of barely enough time to even get people their supplements. And about 7 to 14 people, you know, respond to the treatment with mild, maybe a little bit of improvement, but not a big deal. Okay, so, I mean, the, the, the overall, the I think that the study was kind of a bust, you know, from that standpoint. It wasn't long enough, but and the sample size was small. But what was interesting about it was what they found was that the clinical response to 5-HTP treatment appeared to have some correlation with the measurement of 5-HA in the urine. Essentially, non-responders of the 7 of 14 exhibited significantly lower excretion of the 5-HAA compound, indicating lower levels of serotonin. Well. It turns out if you're trying to bolster serotonin naturally, there's a couple good options. 5-HTP, the one here on the right, has been used for years, and it certainly is effective. The one from New Beginnings is 50 milligrams, one to four capsules a day. You know, for the smaller kids, I might use one capsule, maybe two. And that could be, you know, a, a, a good option. The Sero Plus is more in line with the DOPA plus and the neuro plus in that it contains other ingredients that are also known to, known to support the serotonin system. Okay, it all, but it, it does include 5-HTP. So <clears throat> in this particular case, the Sero plus can be useful with the, with the 5-HTP along with some of the botanicals. If you have a patient or if you have a child who is very phenol sensitive, 
I'm always a little hesitant to give botanicals because some of the botanicals have phenols in them, okay? And that just tends to sometimes aggravate the situation. So in those particular cases, I would probably, you know, isolate things more down to the 5-HTP or the L-tyrosine if I was trying to bolster dopamine. But again, it's some options. Well, what about tryptophan versus 5-HTP? What's better? Okay, let's let's look at this a little bit, and then we're going to kind of up, I'm going to shift gears when I come back to this in the presentation. Tryptophan was turned out; it was banned in the U.S. without a prescription for many years because of the toxicity. It was felt primarily to be, or some of the companies were producing it felt it was from impurity. 5-hydroxy tryptophan was never taken off the market, and because we know that it doesn't have the neurotoxic effects that tryptophan can have. 5-HTP has been used in studies for depression, it's been used in studies for weight loss, and it can be quite effective. Like melatonin, 5-HTP sometimes can lead to vivid dreams, and so, as some parent people interpret as bad dreams. Okay, <clears throat> But hold that thought, because we're going to come back to this as we go through the presentation a little bit more. Another part of the discussion with respect to these neurochemicals that we're going to get into more next month on the webinar on the DNA methylation panel. And then I'm also getting into uh, even to an even more in-depth degree from a clinical standpoint through my online course is the aspect of methylation. This is an incredibly complicated slide at first glance. Okay? And it has to do if we just take orient ourselves here for a second, <clears throat> we've got the urea cycle, which is linked to what's called the BH4 cycle, which is linked to the folate cycle, which is linked to the methylation, also called the transsulfuration uh, cycle. If you've got defects, or I should say SNPs, um, single uh, nucleotide polymorphisms, in your MTHFR, Okay. Um, in your MAOA, in your MEOB, that too can affect the way the body is producing these neurochemicals. And it also turns out that some of these mutations are negatively impacted upon by environmental stress. We know that, for example, in the methylation cycle, the methionine synthase enzyme that is responsible for taking homocysteine to methionine is very sensitive to the presence of environmental chemicals, particularly heavy metals like mercury. So an expanded discussion about these neurochemicals can be layered in by having a better understanding of the biochemistry of methylation. This is just another slide kind of highlighting here as <clears throat> phenylalanine is converted to tyrosine via activation of BH4 to BH2. By the way, you can take BH4 as a supplement. Tyrosine is converted to L-DOPA. L-DOPA is converted to dopamine with the activity of vitamin B6. Tryptophan is converted to 5-HTP. 5-HTP is converted to serotonin with the activity of B6. You can also see why B6 plays such an important role and probably why Dr. Rimlin from the Autism Research Institute many, year, many years ago was advocating for high-dose B6 because it plays a central role in a lot of the neurochemistry and still does um, as a useful supplement. To take it a little bit further, the DNA methylation panel can be useful to isolate things down from a mutation standpoint. If we look at specifically how things may affect from the more common mutations of MTHFR and this one called COMT, these things have direct effect on neurochemicals. We pay a lot of attention to MTHFR, specifically the C677T mutation, because of its effect on folate metabolism and folate's uh, effects on methylation because it's the active folate, the 5-methyltetrahydrofolate, that helps to methylate the cobalamin in the methionine synthase enzyme for methyl B12. But what doesn't get a lot of press is the A1298C mutation. 
A, the A129AC mutation has a regulatory effect over dopamine and serotonin. It also is involved in tyrosine and tryptophan metabolism as well. Yeah, the, some of the folate can have an influence on that too. But when you're looking at MTHFR to really expand the knowledge base, we not only should be focusing on the C677T, but also the A1298C. Because polymorphisms in the COMT enzyme, the catechol o methyl transferase, what it's called, will have a direct effect on dopamine, norepinephrine, <clears throat> and other chemicals in the body. So the reason I'm bringing this up now is just an entry point for later discussion, but to also sort of expand the fact that it's a lot of times when you're looking at these values on the organic acid test, there are other tests that can help to support the clinical situation. For some of you who do functional medicine by looking at adrenals, this is another area to expand. I've often felt that the organic acid test is a wonderful test that complements and vice versa salivary adrenal testing because the adrenals play a significant role in this scenario as well. Remember, the adrenals are this modified nervous tissue, and they have a direct link chemically back into the pituitary, back into the hypothalamus, through the connection of the chemicals that get produced by these different organs. ACTH, for example, which comes from the pituitary, is telling the adrenals to produce more cortisol. Well, we also know that the adrenals get signals uh, in the areas, uh, the adrenal medulla specifically, to stimulate more adrenaline or epinephrine. And then if we take it back even a little bit further and just understanding the whole aspect of chronic stress, in looking at the organic acid test and the different things that it evaluates as indicators of chronic stress, because really the brain and the hypothalamus just respond to change, whether it's change in blood pressure, blood chemistry, blood temperature, blood pH, mental emotional thoughts, etc. It's responding to change, signaling things through the hypothalamus to the pituitary to tell the adrenals to output more cortisol. We get a release of adrenaline because of sympathetic activity. And this whole neural circuitry is at play to try to keep things in balance metabolically. But when we live in this chronic state of stress, which certainly most of the autistic kids I believe live in because of either you know, neurocircuitry imbalances, certainly biochemical imbalances that may be affecting them, and, and then everyone, I mean really everyone else in our society has some level of this too. And over time it leads to the breakdown of the immune system, the breakdown of the cardiovascular system, and we end up with this whole host of labels of chronic fatigue or migraine headaches or depression or ADD and ADHD, whatever it may be. So, <clears throat> and then understanding that it's the regulation of the adrenals and that the fact that the adrenals themselves are part of the nervous system and the fact that all of that has this, this expanded scope throughout our body in controlling sugar metabolism, controlling musculoskeletal function, controlling and regulating what's happening at the brain and nervous system level, controlling thyroid, controlling hormone production, and even controlling the body's ability to detox, all has a relationship here. Okay, so let's come back and just focus our attention now on quinolinic acid and tryptophan. So right here, sitting at 12 o'clock is tryptophan. Right, and then down here at six o'clock, if we think about a face, a clock face, is quinolinic acid. Turns out, again, L-tryptophan can be converted to 5-hydroxytryptophan, and let me go back, serotonin. Well, in the presence of chronic infections, viral infections, <clears throat> even bacterial and yeast infections we can get an activation of this enzyme called IDO. And IDO and dolamine 2,3-dioxygenase can convert tryptophan into more quinolinic acid. It increases the conversion rate to quinolinic acid side of the equations. 
look at this, it can occur in all tissues of the body. Okay. Well, we just talked about the hypothalamus, pituitary adrenal axis, with respects to adrenal stress. Well, it turns out that cortisol and just stress can activate another enzyme called tryptophan 23 dioxygenase and it will, too, convert tryptophan into quinolinic acid. Why is that a problem? Well, in some respects, it's not, because quinolinic Quinolinic acid, in part, can actually kill the activity of this IDO enzyme, can have some that takes tryptophan away from any microbe that might use it to flourish. The problem is, is if you produce too much, you're producing a very toxic compound. Now, beta amyloids. Okay, it turns out that beta amyloid can also stimulate indolamine 2,3-dioxygenase function, and there's a relationship here to candida. Beta amyloids are found in Alzheimer's. This is another complicated biochemical chart, but we'll kind of walk through it here. So at the top is essentially at that top section. It looks very similar to the previous slide we just looked at. Okay, so now we're going to kind of expand it. All right. <clears throat> what ends up happening is we end up passing through the kinderenic stage of these reactions, and we end at quinolinic acid. Remember, quinolinic acid can have a beneficial effect in the immune system by fighting pathogens. It also acts as a neurostimulant. Okay? It can have an excitatory effect in the central nervous system. But when you get too much, it can be a problem. Here's one other benefit or one other effect of quinolinic acid. It produces a chemical called NAD, nicotinamide adenine dinucleotide. Okay? So what is NAD about? Well, it turns out that NAD, or nicotinamide adenine dinucleotide, is the energy substrate to help the redux reactions that occur within the cells. Okay, so we go from what's called an oxidized form to a reduced form. By the way, you can take NADH as a supplement. Well, why is this important? It's important because NAD and NADH are produced by activity of the citric acid cycle, the Krebs cycle, via the metabolism of amino acids, sugars, and fats. And it produces, or it helps to, to produce activity of the, what's called electron transport chain for the ultimate production of large amounts of the energy currency, ATP. This slide comes from a fascinating article that I went through this in great detail in <clears throat> a lecture within the autism course that I'm doing. But it comes from an article called Gastrointestinal Dysfunction of Autism Spectrum Disorders with the Role of Mitochondria, specifically related to enteric pathogens. But if we look at this slide, you look up here, here's our entry point, right? Acetylcoenzyme A. So fat can be converted from there. We can, we can convert glucose into pyruvate, amino acid alanine into pyruvate, and it goes into coenzyme A and it enters the Krebs cycle. And through Krebs cycle activity, we start to spin off this NADH uh, chemical. All right? Well, NADH over here, this is the electron transport chain. NADH is necessary in the electron transport chain in the mitochondria of the cell to produce ATP. If we don't produce enough ATP, we're in trouble. Okay? And what happens in autism? Right? What are the if you think about the comorbid issues in autism, what are the areas that are most affected? Well, certainly the brain and nervous system are. The immune system can be compromised in autism, we know. The gastrointestinal system can be compromised, and many of these kids tend to have coordination problems and either poor muscle tone or fine and gross motor skill issues. It turns out that all of those systems are high metabolic systems. They use a lot of energy, they use a lot of cellular juice to function, which means they use a lot of ATP. And if we're causing a dysfunction in the, in the energy production, 
we're going to have problems in those areas, which is exactly what's manifesting with many of the kids on the spectrum. So when you look at the organic acid test, periodically you will see quinolinic acid being high, as you see here, 7.7, .7, and the next one is 14. <clears throat> Again, in about 10, only 10% 10 of the time do I actually see the quinolinic acid level high itself. The vast majority of times is the 5-HAA being low to low normal and the quinolinic acid 5-HAA ratio being slightly high. The bottom line is if whether you've got a level at 7.7, .7, 14.7, or you know 1,407, it warrants some type of treatment. Okay, and we'll talk about some treatment options here shortly. Well, let me just kind of shift gears a little bit and just focus on another disorder that is also implicated in excess quinolinic acid and brain inflammation and, and degeneration, and that's Alzheimer's. When we talk about hypersensitivity, neurotoxicity, we're talking about the hyperreactivity that can occur along these binding receptors in the brain, specifically the NMDA receptor. The NMDA receptor is sensitive to glutamates or glutamate, and when it's activated, it, it definitely increases electrical activity in the nerve cell. Okay, not a bad thing. It's it's present. It's normal, and that's what it does. It turns out that NMDA receptors are also sensitive to the presence of quinolinic acid. Too much of a good thing is a bad thing in this particular circumstance. So we get hyperreactivity, oversensitivity, and in extreme cases, you can get inflammation and cell death by too much NMDA receptor activity. This was just a research article in 2000 that talked specifically about the effects of quinolinic acid, a byproduct, or excuse me, a product of tryptophan metabolism having an excitotoxic effect on the NMDA <clears throat> receptors. What turned out, what turns out to be the break in that equation, so to speak? Okay, well, here it is uh, saying that quinolinic acid is an NMDA receptor stimulator. Well, it turns out that the other side of the equation in this is the kynorenic acid. The kynorenic acid blocks NMDA receptor activity of too much quinolinic acid. The problem that you'll often see on the organic acid test is that the kynorenic acid is very rarely high. Um, I'd say it's even less, probably 5% of the oats that I see, the kynorenic acid is high. So I don't know how effective it is, um, or if we're just getting such an overproduction of quinolinic acid that the kynorenic acid, its, its effect is a drop in the bucket. It's, it's difficult to say. Well, we know that in Alzheimer's, we get a production of beta amyloid. And we know that beta amyloids can stimulate quinolinic acid. We'll keep an eye, keep an, keep an eye here on candida. Real quickly, let me go through a couple statistics on Alzheimer's. <clears throat> As of 2013, it's estimated over 5.5 million people in the United States have Alzheimer's disease, documented, diagnosed Alzheimer's. About 5 million of those are over the age of 65. About 250,000 are less than 65. That's a lot. Alzheimer's is the most common form of dementia, which makes up about you know, 60, approximately 75% of all cases of dementia in the U.S. You think about it, we're sitting, what is it, 2015? So this number here at 2030 sounds like it's a long time away. I mean, I can't believe how quickly the last 15 years have gone. But they figure by the year 2030, the population over the age of 65 will be upwards of 72 million people in the U.S., approximately 20% of the U.S. population having Alzheimer's disease. That's frightening. And, you know, essentially one in three seniors as of today die of Alzheimer's or some other type of dementia. And what we're talking about is the effect of neuroinflammation. The blood-brain barrier does a pretty good job at keeping bad stuff out and letting the good stuff in. But the blood-brain barrier can be breached. 
And when it is breached, <clears throat> we can get activation of different cells in the brain. The astroglia are the support mechanism for the brain. They help support the blood-brain barrier, they help in repairing, they bring nutrients. The microglia are the immune cells, and they make up a lot of the different glial cells in the brain. And they should have a role in attacking pathogens, and when you attack a pathogen, you're going to get an inflammatory response. But that inflammatory response should turn off. When these microglia become activated chronically is when we start to have a real problem. And you've probably seen this slide before if you've seen some of my past presentations. And it's a good slide because what it's showing us is that there are a number of things that can cause microglia activation. <clears throat> LPS, lipopolysaccharides. Lipopolysaccharides are produced by the cell membranes of gram-negative bacteria. And we have we can have an abundant amount of gram-negative bacteria in the GI tract, and we can be exposed to these bacteria as well. So LPS has the effect of causing microglia activation. Beta amyloid, AB, okay, that's beta amyloid. What's that doing there? Well, it turns out that beta amyloid can stimulate microglia activation. Microglia get activated, it can start producing these neurotoxic compounds. Tumor necrosis factor, nitric oxide, oxygen species, okay, all of them can have an inflammatory oxidative stress factor if too high. And those will then cause either cell damage or cell death. And then when this, the other cells start to die off, well, that just causes more microglia to become activated. We can also have a direct neurotoxic insult. Well, where could that come from? That could be an external chemical that we're exposed to environmentally. It could be a vaccine reaction might cause that, okay? It could be a heavy metal that's causing direct damage to the brain. <clears throat> One thing I want to just mention, and this is quite fascinating, and I'm going to actually do a presentation on this in the future, but it turns out that individuals who do extreme sports, extreme athletes, um, not cliff diving, but uh, like triathlons and, and these types of athletes, many of them actually will exhibit a lot of digestive symptoms after running a triathlon or, you know, or performing some type of athletic event to a real extreme nature. And there's a lot of compelling research to figure out why that's happening. Well, in short, what's happening in part is that many of the bacteria in the digestive system, particularly the gram-negative bacteria, are dying off. And you're releasing lipopolysaccharides and that lipopolysaccharide is then being taken systemically throughout the body. And it can have an inflammatory response, not only in the brain, but on the cardiovascular system, in the liver, and the kidneys. So I'm going to, I'll talk about that at a future uh, webinar, but it's, it's very fascinating how these enteric pathogens can have a direct effect on the brain. Well, I mentioned before beta amyloid. This was just a, a paper in 2011 that was talking about the fact that beta amyloid seen in Alzheimer's disease, can have a direct effect on microglia activity. This is a slide where microglia are actually attacking amyloid plaques. Okay, so now you've got a situation where the microglia are stimulating, excuse me, the beta amyloid are stimulating microglia, and then the microglia are turning back and attacking the beta amyloid. This was a paper that came out in 2003 with respect to Alzheimer's. And it was just reiterating what we've already talked about. Beta amyloid induces production of quinolinate, okay, also known as quinolinic acid, which at neurotoxic concentrations can activate and stimulate microglia. Well, remember I mentioned, or I showed you that slide, about candida. What is the deal with candida and beta amyloid? Okay, Because beta amyloid is actually found to be an anti-candida compound. So the question, and it's not that this has been proven, but the question is, is candida a trigger for Alzheimer's? Well, we certainly know that candida is a major contributing factor in the autistic situation. 
I mean, that's been known for a long time. Well, check this out. This was an article. This was an article. Uh, an article that Dr. Shaw found that talked specifically about beta amyloid is an antimicrobial peptide. In fact, it actually has anti-pathogen effects against a number of different pathogens, bacteria such as E. coli. It also has an effect against candida. All right. So, what I'm proposing. Anybody out there who either has a family member with Alzheimer's or if you're a practitioner that works with Alzheimer's, you've got to start doing organic acid tests on that population of people because they may have some underlying infection and candida that could be contributing to their condition. It's not to say that by the time you get to advanced Alzheimer's that that's going to be turned around completely by just by treating candida. But I often believe that anybody can be helped, and certainly we have to kind of do our due diligence to make that happen. All right, let's refocus. Okay, so we come back now, and we see tryptophan, and we see quinolinic acid, and we see right here beta amyloid. Okay, knowing that it's a it, it too is an activator of the IDO enzyme, candida can be a trigger for it. So now we've got an underlying candida infection that can trigger beta amyloid production to kind of combat the candida, but at the same time it activates the indolamine 2 3 dioxygenase which pulls on tryptophan to produce more quinolinic acid, but then the quinolinic acid can activate microglia and cause neurotoxicity in the brain. It just gets crazy. So there's this, this cyclical loop. So all of the aspect of integrative medicine is really going back to the foundation saying how can we clear some of the stuff away so that we can get a more normal, fu normally functioning system. <clears throat> and that's, that's the million dollar question. That's why we do what we do. We do the testing, we do the diet, we look at pathogens and we try to do for all our patients. We try to put the puzzle pieces together to try to improve the overall quality of health. Let's shift gears again. Okay, and talk about the history of tryptophan use in this country and what happened and why things went so wrong. Well, in 1989, there was a large outbreak of, of what was called eosinophilia myalgia syndrome. It was about 1,500 cases, permanent disability, about 37 deaths. And it was felt to be connected to some type of contaminated lot, some kind of contaminated supply of tryptophan. So in 1991, the FDA here in the United States banned over-the-counter sales of tryptophan, and then about 11 years later or so, they reinstated it. And essentially what they came out with was they kind of said, look, you know, the scientific evidence that's available, you know, we really can't determine the certainty of occurrence. You know, was it the tryptophan supplements themselves? Was it an impurity? Was it something else? We're not sure, but we'll go ahead and, and allow tryptophan to be sold again. <clears throat> well, in 1990, the New England Journal of Medicine had an article that was talking about this scleroderma, this eosinophilia-associated condition in association with tryptophan use. And they actually found a number of people that had very high levels of quinolinic acid, which they knew was a metabolite of tryptophan, that was elevated um, more so in people with a eosinophil condition than those that didn't. And what was interesting was their statement here, okay, and that was the development of the syndrome may result from the confluence of several factors, including the ingestion of tryptophan, exposure to something else that's activating the 2,3-diactionase enzyme, or, and I found this fascinating, an impairment in the hypothalamic pituitary adrenal axis, something we've already talked about. Well, a couple of years later, there's another article that comes out about the, in food and chemical toxicology. And their comment was, was that, yeah, it kind of looked like this manufacturer out of Japan had likely some impurities, okay? And as they're stating here, it eventually became clear that the, the cause had not been the tryptophan itself, but rather that flaws in this particular manufacturing that have been corrected allowed for trace impurities to contaminate these batches. And that, that's what the cause was. That was the problem 
1989 of this eosinophilia myalgia syndrome outbreak. Well, in 2005, there was another paper that came out that were analyzing this whole aspect about the tryptophan, the eosinophilia myalgia syndrome. And what they found was that the lots from this J Japanese company had purity levels of 98.5 to 99.6 purity. That's pretty high. I mean, I'm not a chemist, so I'm sure there's, there's room for trace amounts, but that's a pretty high level of purity. Is it, I think, is it plausible that trace impurities might cause, have caused the problem? Maybe it's plausible. But probably in reality it was something else. If you look back at that time in the in the 80s, tryptophan was a hot supplement. And it was in many cases being used in very, very large amounts. People weren't just taking 250, 500 milligrams a day. They were taking thousands of milligrams a day. Because again, if something in a small amount is good, like a amino acid, then taking more has got to be better, right? Well, they also in this article talked about the fact that in the United Kingdom, there were associated uh, situations of eosinophilic myalgia syndrome that were unrelated to the batches of tryptophan from the Japanese country and also occurred in Ireland too. So is it truly contamination? Well, in 2006, a researcher decides, you know what, hey, I got a bright idea let me inject myself with some quinolinic acid and let's see what happens. So over a month period of time, excuse me, a five week period of time, he injected himself with sub-Q quinolinic acid and then measured his eosinophil count and watched it be low and then rise and then go low. And then he took tissue samples to see if any of the tissues were infiltrated with eosinophils. And what they came away from that was it was really the quinolinic acid that drove the problem, not the tryptophan, because he was injecting himself with just direct tryptophan. Excuse me, with direct quinolinic acid. <clears throat> well, it turns out that quinolinic acid can be a negative effect in many other conditions. Okay? Arthritis can be a situation. And one thing I wanted to wrap up before moving from here is that it's m more likely that what's happening with the whole tryptophan discussion is the level of tryptophan that's being used. And then to complicate the factor, if you're taking a large amount of tryptophan in the presence of a chronic infection, okay, and you're not measuring quinolinic acid, that's where you can get into problems. That's why the organic acid test is such a useful tool as well. So before you'd ever put anybody on tryptophan, at least measure their quinolinic acid levels. But in the vast majority of cases, you get the same kind of clinical results by using 5-HTP. And 5-HTP, once it at that specific chemical state, is committed. It can't go backwards. So quinolinic acid, as I mentioned, you know, can be found in uh, affecting arthritis. It also turns out that a lot of the research feels that many of the um, central nervous system inflammatory conditions related to Lyme may be coming from excess production of quinolinic acid within the cerebral, uh, central cerebral spinal fluid and that some of the neurochemical and, and uh, hypersensitivity issues of the brain come about because of NMDA receptor activation because of quinolinic acid. So a lot of stuff you can see tends to cross over. As I mentioned before, there's a lot of studies that show that 5-HTP can be useful in depression. The reason I'm bringing this up here is that I think from a practical clinical standpoint, um, using 5-HTP tends to work pretty well and I've seen it work you know, very well for a wide variety of patients, and I've used it you know, with a number of kids on the spectrum um, you know, with, with pretty good results too. So, all right. So what are some treatment options for high quinolinic acid? Well, really, number one needs to be what else is going on? Okay, what else is potentially causing this problem to occur? If there's chronic infections or something, 
uh, that that needs to be dealt with. Turns out that garlic and antioxidants can have an effect at reducing quinolinic acid, or at least the damaging effects that it can do. Melatonin might be helpful. But I've often found that niacinamide as a supplement, 500 to 1,000 milligrams, works pretty well. Now, I wouldn't expect quinolinic acid levels to normalize if that was the only thing that was done. I'm, I'm never just putting somebody on niacinamide and then calling it a day. We're doing niacinamide plus diet, plus looking at other factors, looking at infections, etc. Namenda is actually a medication that's used in Alzheimer's. I've used it in autism. Um, it definitely can help with anxiety and compulsive behavior, hypersensitivity reactions. The struggle with Namenda these days is actually getting it covered by insurance. That's become a problem, or more so. And then there are other natural phenols, if they can be used in an individual who doesn't have a phenol sensitivity. Green tea, white tea, you know, these types of things might be helpful. Curcumin is a supplement that can be used. But honestly, the reason I bolded it here in red is niacinamide is not a bad thing to add if you find your quinolinic acid levels are high. All right, we're going to wrap up here and just talk a little bit about phthalates and how that connects. Great Plains will be, and this is being recorded, so this is going to be on their website for you know months and years to come. But for tonight, Great Plains will be coming out with a chemical panel pretty soon. That's going to be able to measure a wide variety of environmental chemicals that we're exposed to. We're going to talk about phthalates here real briefly, real quickly, okay? Because phthalates are something that we're all exposed to. And the reason this is important, let me just go forward real quick. I uh, maybe I skipped over it, okay? Phthalates are chemicals that are commonly found in cosmetics. They can be found in shampoos, toothpastes, um, things that are pliable, things that are rigid, plastics, tubing. Um, they're, they're just, they're, they're used a lot, okay? So we're all exposed to phthalates, and, and pretty soon we're all going to have the ability to measure the level of phthalates that we're exposed to. Why the phthalate discussion is important in this particular discussion is let's orient ourselves again to this chart, okay? Up top, we've got tryptophan. As it flows downwards, it moves through the, uh, the kynorenic acid pathways to become quinolinic acid. We know that quinolinic acid can be converted into nicotinamide adenine dinucleotide. But look up here. We've got phthalate, okay? Phthalate can cause direct mitochondrial dysfunction by reducing nicotinamide adenine dinucleotide production. And phthalates will block this particular converting enzyme, this quinolinate phosphoforo, <coughs> let's see if I can even pronounce it, phosphorobiacyl transferase. All right, so basically that it's, it's preventing this particular converting enzyme to take quinolinic acid to nicotinamide adenine dinucleotide. And remember, this NADH is central to the function and the bridge between the citric acid cycle and the electron transport chain. So I left out the, uh, the slide on, on uh, phthalates. So to summarize here, the organic acid test, and particularly the section on neurochemicals, is really important. It's not just measuring brain neurotransmitters. It's measuring neurochemicals throughout the body. So that's real important to kind of orient yourself to. They can be negatively influenced by the presence of pathogens. We know that Clostridia bacteria can have a direct effect on dopamine and norepinephrine levels. And we now know that we can, have run, we can run into problems of serotonin deficit and quinolinic acid excess because of chronic infections too. So the neurotransmitter section doesn't, is not just to be seen in isolation. It's to be seen in conjunction with everything else on the test and your, your expanded you know, clinical um, ability to draw in information from other tests or, or other you know, case scenarios that you may deal with. <clears throat> A couple things here I want to kind of make people aware of. 
we have a website. If you are an individual that can't order tests on your own, we actually have a website that people can access the organic acid test, as well as other tests from Great Plains, and there's other labs too, BioHealth for adrenal testing and doctor's data and ZRT for other specialized labs. The nice thing about this, this website is you can order the tests, you can do the test on yourself or a family member, and when the results are then sent to us, I would generally sit down or my partner will sit down and do a personalized written review of findings and then give what are called action step suggestions based on the objective data of the test. So it's a great service for that. Okay? And you can find out more information about what tests are available at labtestplus.com. There's a complete list there. There's a section of articles. There's videos that describe the test. There's a lot of information. If you have any questions, there's also a section in the test in the website where you can post, you know, what lab would be recommended for what particular condition. So check it out. <clears throat> Finally, I am in the midst of doing a very intensive autism training course that is specifically designed for healthcare practitioners, but there are some parents who are part of this as well. We are now into, we've already done two lectures, and right at this point, we have presented um, two, well, almost four hours of lecture material, as well as additional question and answer, and we have a, a complete forum that is also part of this course as well, and a ton of material as things are being developed uh, and as we progress through this. So <clears throat> there is the ability to you know, get into this course if, if somebody is interested, uh, but you'll need to email us at autismmastery at gmail.com if this is something you're interested in. If you want to read a little bit more about the course, you can go to the website autism.integrativemedicineacademy.com and we have templates, protocol templates, and office documents and forms, and there's just a tremendous amount of information that is going through this course. This course is being recorded and so once we're done presenting all of the information live, which will actually, the course will end at the end of August of this year, 2015, the course will then be available, of course, for, for purchase after that for immediate viewing and all the documents as well. So, but currently right now it is being, it is live and I'm presenting it live as we move through week to week. So if that is of interest to you, feel free to email us at autismmastery at gmail.com. And then finally, if you're an individual that wants to consult with me, you know, personally, um, whether it's regarding yourself, a family member, your child, then the best place to contact me for that kind of inquiry is at info at my sunrisecenter.com and there's the phone number 951-461-4800. I don't have a slide but again if you're a parent that just has some general questions and you just want some help um, with respects to your child and let's say you're not interested in doing the course I'm doing which is fine you can always reach me at autismactionplan.com okay so Thanks again, everybody, for joining me tonight. If you did post questions, those questions will be sent to me by Great Plains, and I'll answer those through the email. And then we'll, we'll see you next month for another webinar regarding integrative medicine, biomedicine for autism, and uh, other interesting topics. So everybody have a great night, and we'll see you soon. Thank you.